On the phone, it's a pleasure to welcome to the program Marion Nestle. She is the Paulette Goddard Professor in the Department of Nutrition, Food Studies, and Public Health at uh, and Professor of Sociology at New York University. Uh, welcome to the program, Marion. I should also say, obviously, author the uh, also the uh, author, or I guess the um, the editor of Eat, Drink, uh, Vote, and the author of Why Calories Count: From Science to Politics. Uh, many other books as well, and the proprietor of foodpolitics.com. Welcome to the program, Marion. Oh, glad to be here, and just for the record, it's Nestle, not Nestle. Oh, Nestle. No, oh, relation, to, no relation to the multinational food company, and I'm author of both books. Okay, well, uh, that, uh, that, that, that's, that's good to note, uh, and I appreciate uh, your coming on. Um, so uh, let's start uh, first with uh, the the... The sort of the, 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 the dual problem that we have in this country uh, of food insecurity uh, on one hand and obesity on the other. Uh, give us a sense um, how it is that our, our policies in this country regarding food ha have led to this, uh, this paradox. Well, I think, first of all, this is a worldwide problem, not just a problem in the United States. But both problems trace their roots back to income inequality. If we had better income equality in this country, we would have much less problem with undernutrition and not having enough food, or what we're now calling food insecurity. And all because uh, the rates of obesity are much higher in the poor in this country, uh, we would have less problem with that as well. So this is a problem of income inequality. And, and, and so let's, I mean, let's talk about how, uh, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's clear, I, I would imagine uh, it's somewhat intuitive to understand um, uh, food insecurity as a function of income inequality. Uh, how does that play in with uh, obesity? Well, it has to do with the quality of the food that you buy. Um, if you're hungry and don't have enough food, you're going to look for foods that have the highest number of calories for the lowest possible cost. And that's junk foods in this country. Um, and that's what your options are going to be. And, of course, the makers of junk foods advertise specifically to low-income populations. Um, they make sure that their products are widely available in um, low-income areas. They have stores that are, get set up specially to sell to poor people. Uh, Walmart's is a prime example, uh, but there are plenty of others. And the whole system is set up to try to push lower-quality, higher-calorie foods uh, on poor people. Well, let's talk who have, about who have, who have no other options. So, when you say the whole system is set up that way, um, let's let's talk about our our food system in this country. Um, let's start with sort of the the relationship between uh, things like fruits and vegetables versus uh, commodity crops. What are commodity crops, and how does our system promote that? Yeah, well, that's probably the easiest example. Commodity crops are uh, crops like corn, soybeans, um, and sugar beets would be another one, um, where the government either subsidizes or controls the price in some way of those commodities through farm bill uh, provisions. And those provisions, whatever they are, end up encouraging the producers of those foods to produce as much as they possibly can. Um, and because of supply and demand, then the cost of those commodities is lower for just about everybody. Those kinds of price supports, tariffs, quotas, none of those things apply to fruits and vegetables. Um, fruits and vegetables historically have been considered to be specialty crops by the Department of Agriculture, and they receive no uh, government subsidies, no government special pricing concerns, except in small pilot projects. So, I mean, how did, uh, you know, how, uh, how long has this system been in place? I mean, it was this is always the, the case in this country that, um, we were involved in, in promoting essentially, I guess, I mean, and you tell me if I'm wrong, but for lack of a better uh, term, like bad food? 
Well, the the system started during the Great Depression of the 1930s when uh, there was really a terrible problem that farmers were producing food, but nobody could afford to buy them. So farmers had to destroy their crops because they had no outlet for them while there were people who were on the streets begging for food, uh, large numbers of people in those days, not just the way we have it now. So that's how the system got started. And once the system got started, it got entrenched. And then politics took over and kept the subsidy system the way it is now, so that it's almost immutable. Very, very difficult to make any changes in it at this point because it's been entrenched for so long. And the political system is set up so that the very large agricultural producers have a great deal of clout with Congress. Uh, because they help subsidize congressional campaigns and so forth. Uh, so it's been very, very difficult to change that. There were a lot of attempts to try to put into the most recent farm bill uh, subsidies for fruits and vegetables and uh, systems that would promote use of fruits and vegetables and connect agricultural policy to public health. But because of the politics of the farm bill, none of that was able to happen, or very little. I mean, what happened? Uh, my understanding too is that um, uh, in the uh, the uh, during the Nixon administration, um, the 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 plan to uh, subsidize corn in particular really um, uh, really took a root, and and that was sort of a conscious attempt <clears throat> to essentially lower the price of food. I guess. Um, uh, ostensibly to provide us all with more um, uh, with more uh, buying power and and more disposable income is that is that is that accurate uh, well i'm not sure it was the nixon administration i mean this has been uh, <clears throat> this has been in every administration uh, really without exception and the uh, you know it's very hard to argue about low food costs uh, low food costs mean that everybody in the country has adequate to uh, enough food so that they're not starving on the streets. It's just that the way that the system has evolved is to make the cost of junk foods much cheaper relative to the cost of fruits and vegetables. And, you know, if you look at what's happened in price strategies over the last 25 or 30 years, uh, and these figures are collected by the Department of Commerce, the index price of fruits and vegetables has gone up much, much further than the index price of food as a whole or of foods like sodas in particular, where the index price has gone up much, much more slowly than the index price of fruits and vegetables. They're way at the top of food costs. So when poor people say they can't afford to buy fruits and vegetables, they're not kidding. I mean, so what, so what do we do about this? Well, we change policy in some way, and the Department of Agriculture is attempting to do something about it by a number of pilot projects <clears throat> that uh, subsidize the cost of fruits and vegetables at farmers' markets that allow people with food stamps to get twice the value of their food stamp benefits if they buy fruits and vegetables. I mean, there are a lot of these projects floating around throughout the country. They seem to work pretty well. Uh, but they're not national policy. If we want to do something to promote healthier foods uh, among poor people, we need to change national policies in ways that provide poor people with um, more buying power, if not more income. So, uh, so to a certain extent, we 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 if the if the goal is to provide people with healthier food. Uh, and and this is obviously a, a public health issue because um, we all, in some ways, uh, pay for things like uh, diabetes and, and obesity and um, uh, all the other um, uh, diseases that that, that come from um, from uh, the 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 lack of quality food. So on one hand, where we have to spend money to uh, basically create this problem uh, because it's so entrenched, and then we also need to spend money to uh, to fix this problem. Um, I mean, that that seems basically like the 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 the, the, the dilemma. 
Well, that's a pretty good way of putting it. Um, I mean, I think that explains it very well. And so there's been a a great effort over the last, say, 10 years to try to link agricultural policy with health policy. But because different agencies of government deal with those things, there's been very, very little coming together uh, over it. And because there are such entrenched political interests, in maintaining the system exactly the way it's been and not changing it, it's been very, very difficult to change. So this is a political problem, and it requires a political solution. Uh, Give me a a sense of your perspective on labeling. How are we doing in terms of labeling? And and as of late, there's been um, uh, some controversy over the uh, the issue of uh, labeling GMOs. I'm curious as to your perspective on, on labeling in general and specifically in regards to GMOs. Well, labeling in general is in play right now because the Food and Drug Administration has proposed uh, significant changes to the food label that's been around since the early 1990s and has asked for public comment on it and is currently collecting public comment on it. Uh, So when the public comments come in and the FDA has a chance to review them, it will then issue final rules on uh, new food label, this is a very, very slow process uh, that is set up by Congress to take a very long time and to have a great deal of public interest before regulatory changes are made. But uh, the time period for closure on taking public comments uh, is, I think it's August 1st, is the last day that you can do it. And so if anybody wants to file comments on the proposals, they can go on the FDA website and take a look at how to do that. Um, The GMO labeling is quite different. That's a a different story. Uh, The FDA decided in 1994 that genetically modified foods did not have to be labeled as such. I thought that was a big mistake at the time. Um, It was a big mistake. And and I have to say the FDA was lobbied very, very heavily by the biotechnology industry at the time. I was on the FDA Food Advisory Committee and got to watch that lobbying in action. Um, And the industry's view was that if the foods were labeled, then people wouldn't buy them. And the FDA went along with that um, on the grounds that genetically modified foods were not materially different from foods um, developed through conventional genetic crosses. DNA is DNA no matter where it comes from, and was very resistant to the idea of labeling. I thought it was a mistake. And I thought it was a mistake because I thought the public would view it as trying to hide something. Um, If genetically modified foods really are going to save the world's food supply and are really healthy and are really safe and are really all these other things that the industry claims, then they ought to be labeling it with great pride and ought to be insisting that it be labeled. Uh, But that's not how it worked out. And the only surprise that I have is that it took too, it took this long to get to this point. It's been 20 years. And I would have thought that there would have been pressure for labeling genetically modified foods much, much uh, sooner than this. But there's now so much public interest in getting them labeled that the industry has gone to Congress to start talking to Congress about a voluntary labeling program Um, That would allow industry to set the terms of what those labels would look like. Uh, My favorite part of that is that they want to be able to label genetically modified foods as natural. And, um, well, so, I mean, getting back to sort of the the labeling uh, that um, um, the the, the government is contemplating now, like what is important? Um, the this system that we have in place, like you said, is from the uh, from the early 90s. What what is important? what information should be on these labels that we don't uh, already have? Well, the um, the current food label came out of research in the late 1980s that um, dietary fat was a really significant point. Uh, problem. And since then, obesity has become a really significant problem, and that's about calories in general. So the FDA has proposed emphasizing calories 
and de-emphasizing total fat, although leaving saturated fat on the label. It's also proposed something, um, a line for added sugars, which a lot of people are interested in because a lot of sugar is added to food, and most people don't recognize how much sugar is in food. The industry argues that uh, added sugars are no different from naturally occurring sh- sugars, and that's certainly true. But they know perfectly well how much sugar they've added, and I think it would be helpful to disclose it. Um, and then there are some other things about changing the portion sizes. Um, the portion sizes have always been extremely small relative to what people actually eat because they were based on studies in which people reported how much they were eating, uh, and those studies were done generally in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, portion sizes have increased greatly since then. And so the FDA wants to use more recent data to establish portion, portion size standards for foods. It's that kind, a lot of it is extremely technical. And, in fact, the proposal is hundreds of pages. Uh, and, and, and so um, uh, the... Uh, let's move to um, the uh, the way in which um, uh, we, we we protect the safety of our food in this country. Um, uh, give us a sense of where we're really falling down on the job. Well, we're falling we're falling down on the safety issue because the FDA's rules for food safety have not been fully implemented, and the FDA has really not been given the resources that it needs to implement its new rules. We have a food safety system that's divided between two agencies, uh, the Department of Agriculture, which does meat and poultry, and the FDA, which does pretty much everything else, although there's some overlap in some places. Um, in the early, in the mid-1990s, the Department of Agriculture instituted what are called HACCP rules, um, which are a set of food safety rules for uh, producing meat and dairy food safe, safely. And those rules, once implemented, were re- responsible for reducing a lot of uh, contamination problems in meat and poultry products. There still are problems with it, but not nearly as many as there used to be. And in a sense, those rules have been very successful. That is why when the Obama administration came in, it wanted similar rules for foods under FDA's jurisdiction. And when Congress passed the Food Safety Modernization Act in 2010, I think, um, that those rules then went to the FDA uh, for writing up the regulations, and those regulations have been issued one set at a time for the last several years, but they're not fully in place yet um, and won't be fully in place for a couple of years. Once they are in place, um, then it's the FDA's job to enforce them, and these rules require producers to follow, food producers to follow uh, very, very well-established rules for producing foods so that they're not contaminated with uh, living organisms. Um, So I think eventually it's going to work out okay, provided that the FDA gets the resources that it needs to implement these rules. I mean, I I think that's the thing that that people don't understand. Uh, It's one thing to say... Uh, the the rules are on the books, and then of course um, uh, you'll hear industry simply say, "Well, we just need to, uh, we we just need to enforce the rules are on the books." But meanwhile, their lobbying dollars are going uh, to politicians who are saying who are basically starving these agency of the resources they need to follow the right. rules in the books. Yeah, and uh, Congress has been starving this particular agency for 20 years now. And there's been report after report after report by scientific advisory committees talking about how dangerous it is for the country's food supply to have the FDA as weak as it is. I think a strong FDA is good for industry um, because it establishes, it does two things. It establishes a level playing field so that every food producer has to follow the same rules and the ones that mean well aren't don't have to go out front on this and spend more and 
you know, and lose their competitive edge. Everybody has to do it. The other reason is that it, it instills a great deal more trust of the public uh, in the food supply and in the regulatory agency, and public trust is very important for both. Hey, just explain that dynamic. I mean, how, how um, uh, the, in terms of the, the, the uh, the competitive edge that it gives uh, those uh, corporations to basically not follow uh, good food safety practices because that's well, sort of nobody the, well I mean that's yeah, sort nobody. of the opposite story that we hear from let's say a libertarian perspective where it's um, you know that this is uh, this is not for you know that that, that a, a business that produces a food that is dangerous will go out of business uh, for instance yeah well that's, actually that's not what happens um, and we have so much evidence now of co- of cost cutting around food safety issues um, I mean just one um, producer of one food after another after another these things are in the newspapers all the time. Um, food companies are under enormous pressure to produce food as cheaply as possible so that they can keep their prices as low as possible so they can be competitive. And you have, if you have one company that really cares about these issues, takes them very seriously, institutes all of these food safety uh, control plans, tests to make sure that the foods are not leaving their packing plants contaminated and so forth, they're spending more money uh, than a company that's not doing that. And the punishment for companies that don't do it is minimal or non-existent. I mean, I can count on the fingers of one hand. Uh, Companies that have uh, behaved very, very badly around food safety issues and have actually been punished for it in any way whatsoever. Uh, yes, the cost of recall is very expensive, but uh, it's uh, the, what the, from the company's calculations, apparently, uh, the cost of recall is trivial in comparison to the cost of preventive uh, controls. So the way the system has worked is that there is a great advantage to companies that are cutting corners, a financial advantage. And so that's what the FDA rules were designed to try to interfere with and to put everybody on a level playing field so that everybody had to play by the same rules. I think that's a good thing. This may seem an obvious question, but why is it that uh, consumers don't end up punishing uh, a... Uh, a company that produces well, we had to with we we had to do a recall of a bunch of chickens, or we had to do a recall of this or that. I mean, uh, w- why don't we see that from uh, consumers? Well, we don't see it because food safety risks are familiar, and I mean, there's a whole literature on uh, risk communication and risk perception, and that literature tells us that people are familiar with food safety problems. They don't think that they're not very scary um, unless you happen to be somebody who's really gotten hit badly by it. Um, They're very common. Everybody has had diarrheal uh, diarrhea episode. Practically everybody has had some episode of diarrhea due to eating something that they shouldn't have. Um, They were uncomfortable for a day or two, sometimes very uncomfortable. Um, But they pass, and mostly they go away, and it's sort of one of those things. It's a risk that is easily accepted by the public, whereas genetically modified foods, which, um, you know, to the the industry swears, and I have no evidence to the contrary, they've never hurt anybody um, physically. I mean, they have other problems, but they're not a direct source of human illness that anybody could trace, at least. Whereas food poisoning is easily traceable. Um, Human illness is easily traceable to it. But people are much more afraid of genetically modified foods than they are of foods that are contaminated with bacteria. Interesting. That's human nature. Human nature. Well, uh, indeed. Well, uh, Marion Nessel, um, uh, author of Eat, Drink, Vote, an Illustrated Guide to Food Politics. We will link... uh, Uh, to your book at uh, majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. Genuinely appreciate it. My pleasure.